Well, welcome to this presentation where we're going to be looking at terminology related to the nervous system and the topic of neurology. Well, an obvious place to start is with the prefix neur or neuro. Comes from Greek, neuron is the Greek word for nerve, but it's also related to a very similar Latin word, nervous. N-E-R-V-U-S. Now, it means to do with nerves, individual nerves, or the nervous system. So it's quite a widely applicable prefix. So an obvious one to start off with is neuritis. So neuritis means inflammation of a nerve. So, for example, in Guillaume-Barry syndrome, there might be a polyneuritis. So in Guillaume-Barry, there's a reaction to a virus and that can cause a polyneuritis causing different areas of paralysis. Neuro nerve or nervous system itis inflammation of. Neuralgia. Algia means to do with pain. So neuralgia is pain deriving from a nerve. So you can have nociceptic pain coming from a normal pain peripheral sensory receptor or you can have neuralgia where the pain derives from the nerve itself. Neural just means pertaining to a nerve or pertaining to the nervous system. Neurologist is someone who studies the nervous system. Now when we talk about neurology, technically that does mean anything to do with the study of the nervous system. But usually a neurologist is used in the context of a doctor who specialises in disease of the nervous system. And then we have neurosurgery, carried out by neurosurgeons, which is any surgical procedure related to the nervous system. So the prefix neuro or neuro, nerves or the whole nervous system. Now a neuron is a single nerve cell. So here, for example, we have a motor neuron with a cell body and an axon going to synaptic end bulbs, which communicate with a muscle. So a neuron is just an individual nerve cell. You might talk about relay neurons or sensory neurons or central nervous system or peripheral nervous system neurons. It just means an individual nerve cell, a neuronal cell. Now here's some more neuro prefixes. Neuropathy. Well, pathy is disease of. So neuropathy is disease of a nerve or disease of the nervous system. So, for example, someone might develop peripheral neuropathy. Could occur in diabetes. Could occur in vitamin B deficiency. Could occur in abuse of alcohol. But if there's a peripheral neuropathy, there is disease of the peripheral nerves. But the term neuropathy or neuropathy, pronounced neuropathy, just means disease of or disease related to nerves or the nervous system. Now, neurogenic, genic means to begin. So something that is neurogenic begins in the nervous system. So, for example, a patient might be admit admitted to the accident and emergency department with a neurogenic shock because they've damaged their spinal cord. So they're shocked and that problem has begun with damage to the nervous system. It is neurogenic. It began in the nervous system. Now, nervous tissue is actually made up of two types of cell. There are the neurons, which are the nerve cells, but there's also the glial cells. And these glial cells are cells which occur in nervous tissue, but are not themselves neurons. So they're supporting cells and they're nourishing cells. So, for example, in the peripheral nervous system, we have Schwann cells, which form the myelin sheath around individual nerve fibres. The equivalent cell in the central nervous system would be the oligodendrocyte or the oligodendroglial cell because it's a glial tissue. And this comes from a word which originally meant glue because these cells glue the nervous system together. In fact, we now know that these glial cells have many additional functions to gluing the nervous system together. 
but that's still what it means. The neuroglial cells are the cells in the nervous system associated with neurons, but are not in themselves neuronal tissue or not neuronal cells. They are not nerve cells. And interestingly, that's why we can get neuromas because normally nerve cells don't divide. There is not a lot of mitosis going on in the nervous system. Now, there is a very limited amount. When we start to learn about neurology, we'll normally say that nerve cells don't divide. And yet we can get brain tumours. So how can we get brain tumours if the neurons don't divide? Well, the answer is that the glial cells do divide. There's ongoing mitosis in glial cells throughout life. And that's why you can get a neuroma, which is a swelling or a tumour associated with the nerve. So, for example, you can get an acoustic neuroma, where a tumour grows on the auditory nerve, an acoustic neuroma. And that's a schwannoma, because it is a proliferation of the schwann cells, which comprise the myelin sheath of the auditory nerve. Now, neurosis means a condition of the nervous system. But the term neurosis actually is a psychiatric term. We can't quite logically relate the pathology to the derivation of the word. So very basically, when we're talking about psychiatric conditions, there are psychotic disorders and neurotic disorders. Now, a neurotic disorder is a condition where the environment has affected the mind, whereas a psychotic disorder is a disorder of the mind itself. So things like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder are psychoses. Things like anxiety and depression are often neuroses. They can still be severe debilitating mental illnesses, but neurosis is the converse of psychosis. Now here we see neuro used in conjunction with another word. So neurovascular, neuro, nerve, vascular, arteries, veins, that kind of thing. And very often in the body we have neurovascular bundles because the nerves and the vessels often lie close to each other in very protected areas. So for example, there's the posterior tibial neurovascular bundle because the nerves going down to the foot and the vessels going down to the foot are in close proximity behind the tibia for protection. Or the vagus nerve travels in very close proximity through the neck with the carotid artery. So they're protected against external damage. And of course, in clinical environments, we have to be aware of damage to neurovascular bundles. Because if the neurovascular bundle is damaged, that means the nerve supply to an area can be cut off and the blood supply can be cut off as well. So these are areas of the body that we need to learn about and protect and to take full account of, especially in traumatic situations. Neuromuscular junction is the junction or the connection between the nervous system and the muscular system. So here we see a neuromuscular junction. The nerve impulse will come down the axon of the motor neuron. Then there'll be this small gap. And that's actually bridged by a chemical neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. So the nerve impulse will cause the release of acetylcholine that will diffuse across this small synaptic gap, that will depolarize the motor end plate, and that will stimulate contraction of the muscle. So neuromuscular, the connection between the nervous and the muscular system. Now there's quite a few places in the body where there's networks of nerves. In the gastrointestinal tract, for example, there's networks of nerves that control a lot of the coordinated peristaltic contraction of the smooth muscle in the wall of the gastrointestinal tract. So a neuroplexus is a nerve network, a plexus meaning a 
network of nerves. So for example, there's the brachial plexus under the clavicle where various nerves go into the arm from the spinal nerves. They go to the brachial plexus before going into the arm. So brachial means to do with the arm. Plexus is a network. So this brachial plexus is not in the arm, but it takes a lot of the neuronal innovation into the arm itself. Cervical plexus. Cervical means neck, so that's a network in the neck. Autonomic plexus. The arrangement of the autonomic nerves throughout the body can be quite complicated, but there's an autonomic plexus or a series of autonomic plexus going up and down the lateral areas of the spinal cord. Celiac plexus. Celiac near the superior mesenteric artery taking innovation to the organs of the upper gastrointestinal tract. The common name for that is solar plexus. That's why it really hurts if someone punches you in the top of the abdomen. So plexus just means a network of nerves. Synapse is from the Greek, it means conjunction or together or to fasten or to connect together. So a synapse are these junctions or conjunctions between two nerves. And the key thing is that there's always a gap between the two individual nerve cells or two individual neurons involved. Nerve cells don't touch each other. They communicate via these junctions, these synaptic gaps. And information goes across these synaptic gaps in the form of chemical transmitter molecules. Now dendrite is from the Greek for tree. So dendritic neurons are branching out. It's like looking at the branches of a tree. And a dendrite is any nerve fiber which is carrying information towards the cell body. The cons converse of that is an axon, which is a nerve fiber which is carrying neuronal nerve impulses away from a cell body. Now here the top of the skull has been removed and we're looking into the base of the brain case, the cranial cavity. So the cranial bones are those which surround the brain. Anterior fossa at the front, middle fossa in the middle and the posterior fossa with the large foramen magnum, the hole for the spinal cord to exit from the brain down into the spinal cord. So craniotomy would be an opening into the cranial cavity. Cranium is the, is the cavity, the, cranium, the cranial cavity surrounded by the cranial bones. The cranial nerves are nerves which communicate between the brain and the body directly without going via the spinal cord. They're going in and out of the cranial cavity communicating with the body, taking information from parts of the body back to the brain, usually related to the head and neck, but not going via the spinal cord. Craniostenosis is where the fibrous sutures between the various bones that comprise the cranial cavity prematurely fuse, meaning the brain can't grow properly. It's a childhood condition, craniostenosis. Well, here we're looking at the base of the skull, which forms the floor of the cranial cavity. We notice the pituitary fossa. A fossa is an indentation. That's where the pituitary gland sits in life. And then we notice various foramen. So there are several forema, one foramen. Foramen is singular. And these foramen in the floor of the skull are to allow nerves and blood vessels in and out of the cranial cavity. So, for example, we see foramen in the middle there and at the front and the large foramen magnum at the back where the spinal cord enters and leaves. So these are where neurovascular bundles and nerves and blood vessels enter and leave the cranial cavity. Well, now let's move on and think about terminology related to the brain itself. This large part of the brain on top is the cerebrum. 
the cerebellum is that brown part and the brain stem is these there's three parts to it there's the, but they're all in white in this model and the brain stem as i've written it there covers the three parts of the brain stem the midbrain the pons and the medulla oblongata Kephal is actually the Greek word for head and we use it to relate to the head or more commonly to relate to the brain and N means inside so N kephalitis N within kephal related to the head itis inflammation of encephalitis actually means inflammation of the brain and encephalopathy N inside encephalopathy pathy disease of is disease within the brain so for example there might be a spongy form encephalopathy that can be part of Creutzfeldt Jakob disease caused by protonaceous infectious particles often abbreviated to prions or encephalitis could be caused by a virus for example Oma is a lump, so an encephaloma would be a lump within the head or within the brain. Encephalomalacia, it's not a term we often use, but it would mean softening. Malacia means softening of the softening of a tissue, and encephalomalacia would be softening of the brain. Now anencephalic means without a brain. So if children fail to develop properly as a fetus and the brain doesn't develop, they could be born out with anencephaly. They are anencephalic and do not have a developed brain. Hydrocephalus is water on the brain. So this diagram reminds us of the main parts of the brain. Again, the cerebrum at the top, the cerebellum and the brain stem. Now the cerebrum is the large top part of the brain and cerebro relates to the cerebrum. So cerebral means relating or pertaining to the cerebrum. Cerebrospinal means pertaining to the cerebrum and the spine. So for example cerebrospinal fluid will circulate around the cerebrum and around about the spinal cord as well. And cerebrovascular relates to the blood supply to the cerebrum. Now here we see part of the cerebrovascular blood supply taking blood into the cranial cavity to perfuse the cerebrum. The carotid artery actually divides into the internal and the external carotid artery and it's the internal carotid artery that goes into the cranial cavity. So this is cerebrovascular supply. So, for example, there could be atheroma in part of the carotid artery, giving rise to thrombus formation, which can result in embolization. And that's a common cause of cerebrovascular accident when there is occlusion of part of the cerebrovascular arterial blood supply. Well, here we have another view of part of the cerebrovascular blood supply. The carotid arteries are just underneath the start of the middle cerebral arteries. But we notice there's anterior cerebral arteries and posterior cerebral arteries. So blood is entering this circle of arteries. You can maybe perceive this circle of arteries at the base of the brain. The old fashioned word for that is the circle of Willis. Blood enters from the carotid arteries beneath and from the bacillary artery at the back, which forms from the fusion of the two lower vertebral arteries. So part of the relatively complicated blood supply to the brain. Another example of the prefix cerebral is cerebral cortex. The cerebral or cerebral cortex is the outer layer of the brain that contains a lot of the gray matter which contains a lot of the nerve cell bodies present in the cerebrum. So different parts of the cerebral cortex have different functions. And this diagram shows some of the localized functions generated by particular areas of the cerebrum, 
particularly of the cerebral cortex. Well, the cerebellum controls a lot of automatic learned function. So cerebella would be pertaining to the cerebellum and cerebral itis would be inflammation of the cerebellum. Now the spinal cord extends from the foramen magnum. Above the level of the foramen magnum, the spinal cord is continuous with the medulla oblongata of the brainstem. And in most people, the spinal cord extends down to about the second lumbar vertebrae. So let's now look at terminology related to the spinal cord. Now, myel or milo means related to the spinal cord. So a myelogram would be an imaging or a recording of the spinal cord. Myelitis would be inflammation in part of the spinal cord. Myelopathy, a general term, it just means disease of the spinal cord. So, for example, poliomyelitis. Well, the itis means inflammation of. We know the mild part is the spinal cord. And polio actually means grey. So there is inflammation of the grey matter in the spinal cord, which is one of the reasons why the poliomyelitis virus can lead to paralysis. Myeloneuritis would be inflammation of the nervous tissue in the spinal, spinal cord. Now a myelomeningocele, a seal is a herniation. So in a myelomeningocele, the mylo, that is the spinal cord, and here the meningio, the meninges, are exposed. And this happens in neural tube defects such as spina bifida for example where sometimes because of lack of vitamin b12 there's a myelomeningocele and the child can be born with exposed spinal cord and meninges sticking out of the uh, skin and of course that poses a great risk of infection well here we see the spinal cord running through the spinal canal within the vertebrae and we also see the spinal nerves projecting out from the spinal cord. Now the meninges are the layers that cover the brain and the spinal cord and mater is a Latin word meaning mother so these are like the mother of the brain and the spinal cord which I guess is just the way the old anatomists used to look at it but there's three layers the dura mater on the outside underneath that the arachnoid mater then the subarachnoid space filled with cerebrospinal fluid and then the pia mater which is on the surface of the cerebrum and the other parts of the brain and indeed the spinal cord because the meninges go from the top of the head all the way down the spinal canal Mening or meningio means to do with the meninges, these meningeal layers. So meningitis is inflammation of the meningeal layers. Could be a bacterial infection, could be a viral infection. But in meningitis, these layers are inflamed. And if the infection or the inflammation goes down into the spinal cord, that would be a meningiomyelitis. And in the same way, if it goes from the meninges down into the brain, that would be a meningoencephalitis, meaning there's inflammation of the meningeal layers and the brain beneath. Meningeal just means pertaining to. A meningocele is a hernia. So, for example, if there was a neural tube defect and the meninges were exposed in spina bifida, that would be a meningocele. And a meningioma is a tumour of the meninges. So meningioma is a fairly common type of tumour. Fortunately, they're usually benign and the neurosurgeons can take them out. Now here we're looking inside the parietal bone, inside the cranial cavity. And we can see the grooves where the arteries lie of the middle meningeal artery. So there's an anterior branch of the middle meningeal artery 
and a posterior branch of the middle meningeal artery from a common middle meningeal artery beneath. And this is important because rupture of the middle meningeal artery can often be associated with injuries to the side of the head where the parietal bone is affected or might even be fractured. And this can cause extradural hematoma, sometimes called epidural hematoma, very serious cause of secondary head injury. And here we see models of the anterior and posterior branches of the middle meningeal artery on this skull in their correct anatomical positions. Now, lepsy is derived from the Greek word leps for fit or a seizure. So epilepsy actually means a predisposition to have epileptic seizures, but technically it means around or above fitting or having seizures. Epileptic is someone who suffers from epilepsy. Narcolepsy is a condition where people keep falling asleep. Narco is sleep. So narcolepsy is people who have a predisposition to fall asleep all the time. And the person suffering from that will be a, a narcoleptic. And catalepsy is a rare condition where you can get fixity of posture. Somewhat similar to catatonia, but very rare condition. Well, in neurological conditions, unfortunately, paralysis and weakness are both common. And plegia means paralysis and paresis means weakness. So quad is Latin for four and tetra is Greek for four. So quadriplegia and tetraplegia both mean paralysis of four limbs. For example, as would happen with a cervical spinal cord lesion. Paraplegia is paralysis from the waist down. Monoplegia would be paralysis of one leg or one arm, paralysis of one limb. And the hemiplegia is paralysis down the midline of the body, affecting the right arm and the right leg or the left arm and the left leg. And it would be the same with paresis. So we could have a quadroparesis or a tetraparesis. We could have a paraparesis, a monoparesis or a hemi paresis in the same way as we can have a plegia. But the plegia refers to a fairly total paralysis or a total par par paralysis and the paresis is a weakness. Now difficulties with speech also arise in neurology and aphasia means someone who is unable to speak at all after a cerebrovascular accident for example. So a or an as the prefix at the front of the word mean without. So aphasia, someone without speech. Dysphasia is difficulty with speech. This is not dysarthria. Dysarthria is difficulty forming the words because the tongue or the lips or the, the mouth won't work properly. But dysphasia means that you can't bring the words to mind. You have difficulty thinking of the words. It's a neurological phenomena as opposed to a motor phenomena. And we sometimes describe people as being monophasic. And that's where they can just think of single words or sometimes they can get out a single sentence. But they cannot conduct a fluid conversation.